What makes any center of excellence also is, and Nick Hopkins used to talk about this, yeah. that's not enough to sort of do, you have to disseminate. Mm -hmm. So we publish extensively about 100 peer-reviewed articles, multiple books, multiple presentations every year, um, many dozens of international presentations. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways we do this is with, we have our own, we're one of the few departments of neurosurgery in the country that have our own medical illustrator and our own oh, wow. communication sort of program. So when we are doing cutting edge science and yep. breakthrough techniques and technologies, we're able to efficiently write and disseminate and publish and share this information quickly. with our peers quickly. Wow. Yeah. So that's sort of our communication office. What would be next steps after that? And once you've gone and you've published something that you've scientifically been looking at, mm -hmm. what happens after that stop? So typically, hopefully people read it and right. um, actually, we have some of the most highly cited neurosurgeons in our group here at UB Neurosurgery with um, Adnan Siddiqui, yep. Nick Hopkins, uh, me. So I think then usually when we publish, we're invited to speak. Mm -hmm. So right now, for example, one of our colleagues is in Dallas. Mm -hmm. I'll be flying to Japan and be one of the honored guests at the Japanese, uh, at the Congress for them, Japanese Neurosurgical Society. Okay. Um, recently, I just got back from India. So the reach fortunately um, is now global right and I think even with social media so we post a lot on our professional so social media yep. accounts people see it globally and then they invite us to kind of share and talk and interact neurosurgeons using social media yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing you know I mean it's to know that you're able to have that kind of reach and then hopefully you're drawing that kind of attention so yeah. that people are more interested in what you guys are disseminating, putting yeah. out there. It's completely changed the way we, we educate people. So I, su I submit an article, it may take a month for them to read it, then mm -hmm. it comes back for revision. Yeah. And it, the peer review process is important because then you know the content is vetted yep. and it's real. But till it's in print, it may be months. Um, versus I think social media, while it's not vetted and yep. you know who knows if it's accurate or not, it's out there instantly and people can decide for themselves. Our peers can decide for themselves, this is valid, this is not, this is right. useful. I wanna learn more about this, t this technique or this technology. Right. So like anything, yeah. right, it's a double-edged sword. It's, it's quick, it's efficient, but. When it comes to neurosurgery and spinal and, and, and brain injuries and brain cancers, you almost feel like, okay, it's worth taking that chance. It's worth getting that information out there just to see uh, what others are saying. I, I feel like yeah. it's just so urgent and so needed right now. I, I agree and I'd love to see a future where we have sort of that instantaneous transmission of information through yeah. social media but credibility checks. Yeah, see this is where social media can be useful. <laughs> right, exactly, <laughs> yeah. exactly. So ah. these are our, our 3D printers and as you see they run almost 24-7. Oh, it's working and right now. You can see it working right now yeah. and uh, the team here produces highly accurate down to the sub-millimeter anatomical models. Wow. So the blood flow of the brain, blood flow of the heart, and this way we can test devices, test technology, practice techniques. On those techniques. 3D models. On those 3D models. We can actually print your, your brain vasculature, exactly your brain vasculature, create wow. a silicone, I call it silicone, but it's yep. more complex materials, and actually practice on your vasculature if, for example, you had something that we were going to treat, mm -hmm. practice in 3D if it was complicated, or the trainees can practice before we do it for real. And that's what the, these machines make? These machines make a whole lot of uh, anatomy, but this, that's one example of what wow. they make. That's amazing. That's impressive <laughs> that you can take somebody's physical, a piece of the, their physical anatomy and put it in a 3D model that you can actually look at and work with before even getting to the patient. It's amazing and I think it's sort of replaced having to do cadavers or yeah. the old way of training. So we have engineers who come to test new devices okay. on these 3D models. We actually have FDA um, do you really? that, that comes and we are working on a program where we can basically give enough credibility to these models for yeah. device testing um, that basically validates techniques and technologies to limit human wow. testing, so pre-human testing. Now that's kind of in the works, yeah. um, and we hope very soon to get to a point where 3D models 
give enough of a burden of proof. Right. Um, and we to can show the efficacy. To of show efficacy and then launch into humans quickly. Wow. Well, that's, and this is all part of the Jacobs School of Medicine, Jacobs Institute, that we're, this is where we're in right now, and these are housed in here as part of this teaching facility that, that you guys have here. So right now we're in the Jacobs Institute, which is an innovation center. It's mm -hmm. a, certainly a collaborative, and we sort of call it international airspace, where clinicians and scientists from the University of Buffalo, mm -hmm. Jacobs School of Medicine, engineering school, physicians from Kaleida Health, um, engineers that are only employed by Jacobs Institute wow. can come here and really create next generation technologies and sort of the future of medicine is being developed here. You don't think of engineers as being in the medical field. You ju I just would never automatically put those two things together, but they're vital in the work that you guys do. Bioengineers are, are critical and it's really recently, and again, Nick Hopkins, who is yeah. a former chair and the visionary behind Gates Vascular and Jacobs Institute, which said we need to break down the silos between bioengineers, engineers, and surgeons because we need their technology, we need their engineering mm -hmm. to help build medical technology so we can take care of patients better. Mm -hmm. And engineers need the physicians as a compass, yep. right? Sometimes they may be building technology that doesn't have an impact or maybe doesn't have utility, mm -hmm. sort of a solution looking for a problem. But by coming together, it's like, hey, we, we have a problem. We don't have a device that can address this problem. Help so us. So you guys are able to give them a goal line, a goal post. Exactly, and a compass. Some, a compass for what they have. Exactly. That's really interesting. So where to next?